weeks ago. Uh, the uh, the and board are about to demonstrate how the uh, the North Bay the white cars might work as well. slipway and live in a boathouse and that's why her wheelhouse is relatively low compared to some of the other lifeboats but in order to put her up the slipway obviously everything above the top of the wheelhouse has to be able to fold down to get into the boathouse door so that mast and all the aerials are on hydraulic rams and that will all fold down to allow her to get up into the boathouse so John's just um, getting himself ready uh, we'll be looking to put the uh, put the Y boat back into uh, back into the uh, the stern door on Tamar. So here he comes, making his approach now. All about just getting it right. Just give it a little blur. Okay, and that's how it's nicely. And then the guys all then um, jump on there and pull the boat up. And he's remembered to tilt the engine up this time. He didn't last time. Hold on. Okay, and the rod's just using the, uh, the transom door just to pick that up a little bit and help push that Y boat in there. You see, it's very quick, it's very easy, it makes it a very, very effective tool um, for doing rescues then. You see, Tamar's are um, a fiberglass construction, it's not a steel boat, so she's made out of fiberglass, and um, the whole sides are also incorporate up to four inches thick of foam. Uh, so it's a very, very thick construction, and it should in the event that they did suffer any damage, that uh, give us a lot of buoyancy in that boat. And you can see it, you can hear the power from those two Caterpillar C18 diesels there, which gives it an excellent manoeuvrability and a lot of speed and acceleration to get out of awkward situations. And that gives the crew the confidence to put the boat into the areas where they, they know that they need to get in and rescue somebody and be able to move out very quickly as well. And you'll see kicking up the water there on, on the bow, that's the bow thruster providing that power to turn around in a very, very small space. So she's normally crewed by a crew of um, up to seven. And um, Tamar, if you do get the opportunity to go on board the Tamar over on the College Pontoons today, come and have a look on board because there's a bigger story about the inside of Tamar, and that is the care of the crew. Obviously, the care of the, the, the crew is something absolutely vital to us. We send volunteers up to 100 miles off sea, offshore, in any weathers, and we've got to make sure that we take care of them. And on board Tamar, we've got some new crew seats, and those crew seats are designed that they won't bottom out, no matter how big a wave the, the boat jumps off and lands on the water. It's like hidden concrete, we need to make sure that the crew are very safe.
gentlemen, wait for many minutes and we'll start the demonstrations at 35. If you want to come through and take a seat, uh, we'll start shortly. Sure. Should I say good afternoon? My name's Hugh Fogarty and I'm the head of these operations here at the RMI. And I'm going to try and talk you through the launch and recovery of the Atlantic 85. The tractor is a marinized Midland tractor, uh, especially designed by seawater to a depth of about 9 metres. And then the tide goes out again, everything should be okay. It wants the engines to be run before the boat actually gets put into the sea. So when we do the initial turn, the carriage of the engines have been rolled in. The engines are 250 horsepower, the other are four-stroke engines, which have been specially engineered by the Armourite. Giving a signal to the tractor driver that he is ready to launch, he's happy, his engines are working, and all his electronics and radios are working. And uh, the tractor driver acknowledges by blowing up the uh, the horn on the on the tractor, and he then proceeds down to the sea. In reality, this tractor can do just under 20 miles an hour, but obviously uh, when you actually launch it, you do it at fairly slow speeds. But uh, tragedy, the crossover of the wide open reach, we can go quite a bit further and faster. And also, if we're transiting from A to B, the tractor driver can actually turn his wheel around. If you look at the tractor closely, it's got two steering wheels, so he can actually drive it facing either way. He puts the boat down into the water until the, uh, the past the carriage is covered. And as soon as there's sufficient water to cover the propellers, the uh, helmsman will give instruction to the tractor driver and his crew and he will just drive away out of, out of the carriage. And as they now reach that point, away she goes. That's the boat gone, and the tractor driver should immediately reverse back out of the, the water, back up onto the, uh, the hard standing, where the shore crew will rig the recovery net for the uh, boat to come back into. Now, as I said at the beginning, this carriage is specifically designed to allow the boat not only to dry out now first, but to come back into the, into the carriage now first. And in order to do that, we have a net arrestor system, which the crew, the shore crew, are about to bring. So although the kind of event happens in the line of station, most people go to the boat the boat the boat the boat the the shore crew, and they are now there, the boat will be launched and will be in the boat, which is where they are. Now, Martin is just lowering the and the boat weighs with the crew on board just about two tons. Actually, the crew on board probably slightly over two tons, but never mind. Um, so uh, two tons of boat hitting the uh, hitting that net and in the water, and then he's happy to get the carriage to the jet. He will in contact with the boat by the radio. Now obviously this has taken a few minutes to rig, but in reality the boat may have been out for an hour, an hour and a half, so you know, we've only been going out for 11, 11 minutes since I started talking originally, so you know, it's all tucked away, but they have been now. Alright, and so the tractor is now down the slipway. And although we're doing it on a concrete slipway here, this could be uh, an absolutely wide open beach with, um, with uh, you know, five or six feet of surf rolling in, or even more than that. So the tractor put the boat, puts the boat in, or the carriage in, until the, the side arms are just covered with water. And then he'll come to a stop. There we are. And now he'll be telling the helmsman that he's ready. Now the idea is that the helmsman will pick the biggest sea that he can find and he will run in on the back of it. That's the safe. They've got two rope springs which are fixed to the carriage and there are two horns on the back of the tubes of the, of the lifeboat and they will, as soon as the boat comes to a stop, they will put the ropes over the horns. So in he comes, he's now doing about 15 knots I hope. Head for the net, head for the net, straight in, toggles break, everything stops. Bands are on, and the tractor driver is given a signal by the helmsman to proceed up the beach as fast as he can. So, getting the boat out of the way before the next breaker comes in behind them. So, from actually hitting the net to the tractor starting to move about four and a half seconds, which is not bad going at all. That's with the scratch crew. Interestingly, the boat is 
Big hair drove with two golf tees from the back of it. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of minutes. If you want to come in and just get a final seat, vantage point, and I'll pass you over to Owen from Barry Court, who will. Uh, Talk to you the capsized drill that's going to take place for the D class in the water to begin. And then to Scott before he gets up there. Now he's on his way in now, so I'll get out of your way as much as I can. Okay, the hovercraft works on the pistol, closing on the pistol there. Over the top. And the power drive on the bottom. Okay, beautifully done. I could have done it that well without touching the hovercraft. Okay. I'm blocking the air from being blown out through the back of the hovercraft by a set of ailerons which actually interrupt the airflow. The downside of that is that it stops the back end from looking at the front of the house. There's a nasty one. Behind you when you walked in, if you looked at the lifeboat which was on its side, that was full of instruments. Instruments that measure acceleration vertically, transversely and longitudinally, but also motion. Also you'll see on one of them that they've got a TV camera in the front, so we can actually get a view of how the lifeboat is performing as if we're sitting inside it as the coxswain. What's happening now would because there's lots more properly. The first one should be operational on station. It is in the water with the launch and recovery gear ready to replace the Mersey. And thereafter, we'll build more for the Mersey replacement. <coughs> because it is a beach launch and recovery lifeboat, we need to make sure that we can handle those conditions. Some of those designs were existing commercial designs. Some of them were ones that were created just for us. And also we designed one ourselves. And I'm glad it's powered by two batteries and the batteries can basically give us 
20 minutes at full power. Mark with a 20 minutes to power cell into C's, with C's behind them, C's on the side. So we've put these models through everything that. What we're going to do now is we're going to uh, hand over the harbour to the model display, the, the, uh, the model makers, and they're going to put their replicas of, uh, I think we've got seven class, class one Aaron, and I'll hand the microphone over to one of the guys here and he can take you through to talk to you about the model making. Thank you very much. Well, I'm just behind this grandstand, which is the first production set for 17 of these boats. When you see the front, you'll see there's a propeller on the front, and it allows the boat to swing on its own axis. It's very, very maneuverable. So that's the largest boat that the, the RMI do. They've stopped making them now. They make 46 in all. 